So the reading is taken from 1 Kings chapter 17, beginning to read at verse 8. Then the word of the Lord came to him. Go at once to Zarephath of Sidon and stay there. I have commanded a widow in that place to supply you with food. So he went to Zarephath. When he came to the town, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and asked, Would you bring me a little water in a jar so that I may have a drink? As she was going to get it, he called, And bring me, please, a piece of bread. As surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. I'm gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son, that we may eat it and die. Elijah said to her, don't be afraid, go home and do as you have said, but first make a small cake of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me, and then make something for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, the jar of flour will not be used up and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord gives rain in the land. She went away and did as Elijah had told her. So there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and her family. For the jar of flour was not used up and the jug of oil did not run dry, in keeping with the words of the Lord spoken by Elijah. This is the word of the Lord. Our Gospel reading this morning is taken from John's Gospel and from chapter 2. Hear the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory Glory to you, O Lord. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Dear woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied. My time has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realise where it had come from though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, Everyone brings out the choice wine first, and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. This, the first of his miraculous signs, Jesus performed in Cana in Galilee. He thus revealed his glory and his disciples put their faith in him. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. And now Tim is going to come and uh, speak to us this morning. So as he comes up, just pray for him. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for its inspiration. Thank you for the teaching that we can receive for it. We just pray that you would bless Tim now as he comes to speak and bless the words he has for us this morning for we ask it in jesus name amen well let's uh, spend a, a few moments uh, reflecting on that uh, gospel passage from gone uh, john's uh, gospel and uh, I wonder, the first thing I was going to ask was, uh, have you ever been on a treasure hunt? Yes, good. 
you'll know what I'm talking about there. Hopefully, can't guarantee it. Um, where you know where you follow a set of cryptic clues or directions to find uh, treasure, and then hopefully, when you have found and understood the clues one by one, uh, you reach your goal or your destination. Well, let me just try a few cryptic uh, clues. They're not that difficult, actually, uh, and see if you know the answers. Uh, in a treasure hunt, of course, finding the, uh, the, the thing, the clue, it usually points you, doesn't it, to, to the next clue, and so on, until you get the whole point, until you get to your destination. How about, uh, how about this one? I'm not a selfie, but I do show faces. Find me in bathrooms and a few other places. Of course, simple. And uh, most every day you step on me. All I require is a bend of your knee. Step. Too easy, aren't they? Too easy. But it's not, not that early, but it is fairly early on a, a Tuesday. Yes, a couple of very simple cryptic clues. And you might be wondering what this has got to do uh, with today's Gospel reading. Well, actually John's Gospel is planned as a kind of treasure hunt. He includes careful and sometimes cryptic clues for us to, to follow. His Gospel has begun by setting the scene with the accounts of uh, John the Baptist and then Jesus calling his uh, first disciples. <coughs> Excuse me. And then he gives us this first clue in the treasure hunt, which we might just call, just who is this Jesus? How do we know that it's a first clue? Well, John tells us himself when he says Jesus performed this first miracle in Cana in Galilee. And he'll add, of course, to this first miracle as his gospel message unfolds. But the word that John uses for clue is sign. His gospel is a series of signposts pointing us to who Jesus is, and I hope pointing us towards a faith in God. In many ways, the sign, uh, signs that uh, John tells us about <clears throat> answer, answers the question that Nathaniel poses to his brother Philip when Philip says, I found the one Moses talks about. It's Jesus of Nazareth. And if you remember, Nathaniel says rather sarcastically, can anything good come out of Nazareth? It's a bit like saying, can anything good come out of Leicester if you live in Loughborough? Strap in, John says. I'll tell you what kind of good can come out of Nazareth. And here's the first sign. This is one of those moments when heaven is opened and the transforming power of God bursts into the present world, turning what we expect on its head. With the miracles, the signs that Jesus performed, I think living in 21st century Western Europe, in our logical, rational Western mindset, perhaps we can dismiss them simply as uh, stories that didn't happen, but which illustrate some supposedly deeper, more spiritual truth. But the whole point of the signs that Jesus did are moments when heaven and earth intersect, where they come together with one another, where heaven bursts into our ordinary logical world. And John wants so much to tell us, to show us with these events, the life of heaven coming down to earth. It is really the motto, the underlying theme of his gospel. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. God has met us in person. Heaven and earth have intersected. For those few short years, they came together more powerfully perhaps than they have ever done before. Not uh, that they won't happen again in the future. But God met us in his person. Heaven and earth have intersected. And the first sign that we read about this morning, this turning of water into wine, has all the features that we'll encounter, that we will encounter in the other miracles that John records for us. They're about 
transformation. Jesus' ministry is a call to each person to accept the transformation that God can affect in our lives for our own good through the presence, the very presence of Jesus in our lives, through his teaching, through his spirit, the hope of his promises. How does this happen? It happens when, as Mary tells the servants, people do whatever Jesus tells them. The servants obeyed. Take those water jars, fill them with ordinary water, he says. The servants obeyed and they become part of the miracle of turning water into wine. And our own transformation comes when we believe who he is as well. And when we follow his direction, when we obey his call on our life. Well, getting back to, uh, to John's account of events... You may know that this is uh, the first and only two occasions when John mentions Jesus' mother Mary in his gospel account. The other time, of course, is when she is there at the foot of the cross. And this is important as it explains John's recalling of Jesus' rather strange words to his mother. My time is not yet come. When he asks, when she asks him to do something about the lack of wine in the party. My time has not yet come. And the next time Mary appears in the narrative, Jesus' time has come. And the glory is revealed as he dies on the cross for the sake of the whole world. So the two phrases, my time has not yet come. And when he dies on the cross, his time has certainly come are part of John's narrative. For John, the ultimate event, the ultimate moment when heaven and earth meet, <coughs> excuse me, is when through faith we see the glory of God hidden in the shame of the cross. It's events like this, this first sign, this first miracle, this turning of water into wine, that begin to point us to that moment, the cross. And the setting of this story itself, at a wedding, has even further significance. The wedding is a foretaste of what is to come, as it points to that great heavenly feast in store for God's people. When you read those accounts of what... Revelation describes as the end times, as when Jesus returns, that worship in heaven. This is, if you like, an earthly precursor to that great heavenly feast, this wedding in Cana of Galilee. It points us to what is to come, as do, in many ways, the water jars. They were used for uh, Jewish purification rites. So to make someone uh, pure before worship, for example, um, they're a sign um, that uh, you purify yourself. And here again, they're used as a sign that God is doing something new from within that old Jewish system. God is bringing a deeper, a more permanent purification to Israel and to the whole world in this new way as Jesus sets out on a journey to the cross where he'll purify the whole world or those that put their faith in him. Faith in Jesus, in the work of his salvation on the cross, are this new way of finding spiritual purification and forgiveness in God's sight. And using those purification water jars was another sign pointing to what is to come. And the wedding itself would have probably uh, included invites for the whole town. A bit like everyone here, um, if you've got a family wedding coming up, uh, just inviting everyone in Thorpe Acre uh, and from neighbouring villages too to your next family wedding. That's how Jesus and Mary and the disciples got to be there, even though they may have not known the bride or groom very well. It was a grand social occasion to share the joy of the wedding with the whole community. And so running out of wine wasn't just inconvenient. 
I don't know how you would feel if you'd invited the whole community to your party and the food and drink uh, run out before the party was over when it was in uh, full swing. For them it was a social disaster and a bit of a disgrace really. The family would have had to live with the shame of it for a long time to come and it might have been regarded by uh, the bride and groom as a bad omen, bad luck for their future. And so, although the main point of the miracle, the sign, is to point to things eternal and glorious, our purification, the salvation of the whole world, don't we also begin to witness here the compassion also that comes from Jesus when people are in need? How he deals with that need in an unexpected way often points to the things beyond that immediate issue to spiritual matters of great importance. But here the miracle itself is a sign of the compassion that Jesus has for us. He spares the blushes of the bride and groom and their family by turning the water into wine. He transforms their situation. If you like, he brings a little bit of that having life in all its fullness into what could have been a pretty embarrassing moment for the wedding party. This account of turning the water into wine invites each one of us into the transformation that putting our faith in Jesus can have on our lives. It points to the fact that faith in Jesus makes us pure, signified by those purification uh, jars. It points us, because it was a wedding, to the hope of that great feast in heaven which God has prepared for each one of us. And it was also a very, although a miracle, although a sign, a very practical demonstration of the compassion that Jesus has on each one of us. Although his time had not yet come, he couldn't just walk away and leave those people in despair. He transformed the moment as he transforms the eternal in each of our lives. So as I close, as I, close I want to uh, invite us to pray in the quietness of our own hearts just for a few moments. To ask Jesus to transform our lives perhaps in areas of failure, or need, or disappointment, or perhaps even to encounter his transforming forgiveness for the first time, or for a new time. Our prayers are offered remembering that if we take Mary's words seriously, do whatever he tells you, then that transformation can be a reality as heaven breaks into earth, into our lives. Jesus is involved in the personal of our lives. And not, not just one great grand gesture. He's involved in the detail, the despair, the disappointment of each of our lives and wants it to be transformed. Our prayer could just be uh, a simple request therefore. Jesus, transform my life once again or for the first time into one of fullness, forgiveness and hope. Let's pray for a few moments in the quiet of our own hearts as we come before God, before our Lord Jesus in prayer. Lord Jesus, we thank you that uh, you came to show us the way, to teach us how to obey everything that is good for us in our lives, the purpose and the pattern that God set before us. Lord, we thank you that through this miracle you point us to that purification, that forgiveness of sins that faith in you brings. We thank you, Lord, that this miracle, this sign, points us to the hope of that great feast in heaven 
when the dead are resurrected to share an eternity in your presence. We thank you, Lord, that even with those future things to come and that sense of hope and joy that you have rescued us from sin, that also you're compassionate and interested and involved in our lives on a day-to-day -day basis and want to transform our lives so that they are living lives in fullness. Lord, we thank you this morning for your compassion to us and your word. In your name, amen. begin our preparation for Holy Communion with the words of the Nicene Creed on page 7. Let us say together, we believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again, in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. For our prayers this morning, you're going to need the use of both of your hands um, this morning. Uh, can I just start the prayers by saying, uh, on the bulletin sheet each week, uh, there are prayers for each day uh, for things around our parish. Please take those away and use those in your own prayers. I'd like you to start this morning by placing your hands on your laps upwards. As you do so, in your own mind, just become aware of all the issues and concerns that you've brought with you this morning. The unfinished business sticky relationships, the work that's awaiting you when you get home, or decisions that have to be taken. Hold all these things in your hand. Feel the weight of them. Recognise that they are a part of you at this moment and that you've brought them with you before God. As you think of those things, I want you to turn your hands over so your palms are now down, almost as if you're emptying things out. Feel all those issues and concerns slipping away 
falling out of your hands. Let them fall into the hands of God, who's always there to catch everything that needs to be caught. Let yourself release to him those things that you don't need to keep hold of. Feel the freedom, the lightness, as some of those things fall away. Now turn your hands over again so their palms up, but now empty, no longer carrying the weight and burdens they were before, but also ready to receive, to receive the good things that God has to give you. Maybe God wants to put back into your hands some of the things that you were thinking about and see them in a new, fresh way. Maybe there are other concerns that he wants you to be more involved in than some of the mundane things of this world. But remember, God is always wanting to give us far more than we can imagine. As we go about today, be open, be open to receive whatever it is today that God has for you. Father, we thank you that you hear our prayer. You hear the prayers that we say in silence, in our hearts, in our minds, and those that we say out loud. We thank you that you promise to hear our prayer. Amen. And as our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen.